Good afternoon, good evening, and good night, depending on what part of the world you find yourself. And welcome to the Black Consciousness Festival. Today is a very important day for us. The festival has been running all through the month of November, but today is particularly an interesting day because today, the 20th of November, Brazil celebrates Black Consciousness Day. And it is because of this day that this festival was created. The Black Consciousness Festival provides a global online platform for the commemoration and the celebration of sharing of vital histories and stories that boost the awareness and the impact of the pride, power, practice of the people of African descent. The festival builds awareness around how each of us can take the necessary steps for restitution and reparation. This evening's conversation, it, Black Consciousness in the Caribbean, Revolution and Writing, is the 15th of our 20 conversations for 2020. The conversation will be led by Mr. Llewellyn McIntosh. McIntosh is a retired, retired in 2008 as a secondary school principal in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, and has spent a great deal of his life writing and singing calypsos. Since his retirement from the mainstream formal education system, he has been working with the MILAT program, a military-led program set up especially to assist at-risk young men in the transformation of their lives. On weekends, Short Pants, his stage name, becomes a freelance broadcaster and hosts two popular shows on the state-owned radio station, Talk City 91.1. It gives me great pleasure to introduce as our lead panelist this evening, my own father, Llewellyn McIntosh. Have a great conversation. You are on mute, Mr. McIntosh. Good evening to everyone. And I take my cue uh, from the first speaker. Um, good morning, good night, good day depending on where you are. I want to say that I am honored, and that, of course, is putting it mildly. I was totally swept off my feet when the invitation first came, requiring me to be the lead presenter, particularly when I heard the names of my co-speakers. Um, it really is a great honor. I am flattered by the opportunity and um, I hope that I can live up to the expectation of the organizers. Um, following the tradition, I would like to begin with an invocation and I have decided that the invocation this evening will be a piece of music. Um, Robert Nelson is a Tubigonian by birth he is domiciled in the United States of America. He is known as Lord Nelson in the Calypso world. Um, currently, he is one of the oldest living performing Calypsonians. I believe he is 88 years old or close to 88. Um, he's got a piece of music called Shango. I want to invite you now as the invocation before this, this evening's conversation to pay attention to Lord Nelson's Shango. Shango 
they're doing, trying to understand. It was so amazing since I came from another land. The high priest approached me whole and shake me hand. Welcome home, me pick me. Welcome back to Shango land. Yeah. Alado ye, he said. Alado ye, oh. Alado ye, ayaba. Shango worry, do ye. After that bit of inspiration from Lord Nelson, um, permit me to introduce my colleagues who will participate in this evening's presentation. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Merle Hodge. Um, she was educated both in Trinidad and Tobago and in the United Kingdom. Dr. Hodge has spent most of her life in the field of education, teaching in Grenada, Jamaica, the Virgin Islands, the United States, and of course, in Trinidad and Tobago. She is also a writer who has published two novels and a number of academic papers. Her third novel is almost ready for publication. Of course, it is an understatement to simply say that Dr. Hodge is a novelist. She is in fact the first black Caribbean woman to have published a major work of fiction. As a cultural and social activist, Dr. Hodge was co-founder of the group called Women Working for Social Progress. The second panelist is an Alan Pierwood. He spent his childhood in Trinidad and Tobago and Barbados. A number of circumstances appear to have created the man that Alan Pierwood has turned out to be. Firstly, his education at Trinity College in Mocha, where one of his teachers shaped his view of history Secondly, there was a critical incident when he was a youth at the Breton Hall Hotel in Port of Spain, where he was the victim of a clear act of discrimination, where he was refused the use of the hotel's swimming pool. Thirdly, Mr. Herewood witnessed the assassination of Bas Basil Davis in Woodford Square in 1970. For those who might be unaware, um, Basil Davis's funeral is still on record as the largest funeral ever in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Alan Herewood, after these events, quite naturally became a member of NJAC and later a freedom fighter with the group called NUF, the National Union of Freedom Fighters. And absolutely no, no disrespect, the final pan panelist, Mr. Kafra Kambon. He's a well-known national figure in Trinidad and Tobago. He took center stage in 1970 when he emerged as one of the leaders of the Black Power Movement. He's an economist 
by profession, and he has involved himself in the areas of social mobilization, economic research, human resource development, mainly in the Caribbean region, but also with organizations linked to the Pan-African Network. Brother Kambon has served as chairman of the Emancipation Support Committee for several years. He has been awarded the Shakonia Medal for his community work. So those are the three panelists, Dr. Merle Hodge, Mr. Allen Pierwood, and Mr. Capra Kambon. If I may be permitted, if I may be so bold to uh, begin the conversation by reflecting on a very personal experience of my own. The topic this evening, revolution and writing. And if I had to make a statement, my statement would be that it always appears to be so difficult for black people to get anything. Don't misunderstand me. It is not that black people have not achieved many things. I, I don't have to go through. In fact, um, the bit of music that springs to mind is a calypso by Chalk Dust called Inventions of the Black Man. Um, so many of these things are not known. And as we try in this festival to raise consciousness, I reflect on my own experience and something I used to do when I fathered three children. I'm saying used to do because they are adults now and they have not forgotten to remind me. Otherwise, I might have forgotten when I realized or when I saw instances where perhaps they were not serious enough with their education, I used to put them to sand and there were some words I used to get them to recite. And somehow this evening's topic, revolution and writing, and that is R-I-G-H-T, not to be confused with what Dr. Hodge does. Mm -hmm. That's the that's W-R-1. Revolution and writing, correcting things. I had to point out to my own children from very young. And, and in a short while, I would call on my panelists to respond. Um, I wanted to focus and let them understand that Simply by being black, you probably had to work twice or three times as hard to achieve anything. And sometimes the revolution and sometimes the writing. Um, I want to invite my friend Kapra Kambon to speak first, but while he assembles his thoughts, I want to play, I want to invite the technical operator to play another piece of music and um, it will let you see and hear what I used to ask my children to do when they were very young as teenagers to let them understand that they had to work three times as hard. So I want to ask um, that the Black Stalin Calypso from 1982 called Nothing Come Easy, Nothing Come Easy, Black Stalin. And at the end of that, I will call on Brother Kafra Kambon to respond to what I'm saying. So please, Nothing Come Easy, the Black Stalin. You get up one morning, your elders have something, you don't know how they get it, but you want to use it. But if you ask them old people, to get the thing what they went through, ask them this any day, and them elders sure to say, 
Black man got to keep on jamming. Poor black man, you get a little something. Make up your mind to walk ten times harder to get something because of your color. Black man got to keep on jamming. Poor black man, you get a little something. People rob you, humiliate you, turn wrong and whip you, and then they free you. Black man got to keep on jamming. Poor black man, you get a little something. So when you hear, you get a little something. With a more high friends, look your back in because you don't know who are ready. Black man don't get nothing easy. You get up one morning and oil money running. How it come you don't know, you don't care how the thing go But if you read about the riot, you go find out about the pressure How they catch so much whole hell, get a penny from TLL Black man got to keep on jamming, for black man to get a little something You got to take up your own cash money, pay people for your own refinery Black man got to keep on jamming, for black man to get a little something Make up your mind to be a magician, to make money out of scrap iron. Black man got to keep on jamming, for black man to get a little something. So when you hear, you get your little something. With a dragon, now you keep marking, because I don't tell you already. Black man don't get nothing easy. You get up one morning, independence happening. You think the thing come easy, you start taking liberty. But if you know about petition, we had to send to England for some woman to tell we, we in this colony free. Black man have to keep on jamming, for black man to get a little something. You got to go to conference in London to get independence in your own land. Black man have to keep on jamming, for black man to get you, and then they whip you, turn wrong and sell you, and then they free you. Black man got to keep on jamming, for black man to get a little something. So when you're here, you get a little something. With a dragon, now you keep marking, because you don't know this already. Black man don't get freedom easy. So when a black man have something, he got to start thinking to get it easy. He got to practice economy from getting licks from the slave master to become the landowner. It's a terrible journey, black with plenty brutality. Black man got to keep on jamming, but black man to get a little something. You must not make up your mind that you're able to get a bully and jam with the devil. Black man got to keep on jamming. To get a little something, you got to make up your mind that you're ready to swim on show and drop your boat steady. Black man got to keep on jamming, but black man to get a little something. So when you hear, you get a little something. With a hope, you better keep watching because I don't tell you already. Black man don't get nothing easy. I would, I would put my children, when, um, when I felt that the grades weren't good enough in the report, 
or when I felt they weren't serious enough, I would um, make them repeat the famous lines that you're seeing on this slide from the Stalin Calypso. And it is because of that I want to go to Brother Kambon and I want to reflect on 1970. Um, in the introduction, you would have heard me say that he was one of the leaders. And there are those who would say, and of course we can dispute it, that because of the intervention by Brother Kambon and others in 1970, there were a number of things, positive things that came to the black man and the black people in Trinidad and Tobago, and maybe even in the Caribbean. Um, my challenge with it is the sustaining of it. Um, so it's, it's 50 years and we look back. Um, and in my own head, um, and, and it's like what I, I, I was saying to my children and what Stalin just said, um, one still has to continue the struggle and continue the fight. I mean, why? After what happened in 1970, which something that no one could have imagined eight years into our political independence, um, now in 2020, and we tend to copy whatever is happening in other parts of the world, we hear people talking about Black Lives Matter. We now realizing that Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter, 50 years after, um, Brother Kambon, help me, please. Mm -hmm. All right, I had to unmute the mic there. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, for making me a part of, of this important conversation. And I see I'm in very distinguished company of, of people who fought in their own right, and um, which is very, very important. And I would come around to the question you have said about sustaining something, sustaining gains. And that's really quite a challenge because we could see what took place in 1970. We can, and everyone here will um, will experience it from the London side. Um, <laughs> and my brother here experienced it from, well, he experienced two sides of it, right? Because Alan was both in the marches and then he was in the hills. And so he knows it from all sides and he has seen uh, what the consequences of action can be in the most brutal way. Um, and then you can see the things that, that were gained and you see them being lost and it, 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 it is a challenge. But first I would say that not all has been lost. Some things have survived. And I would look at why things would be lost. Because you can have a period of stimulation and what has been called the Black Power Revolution of 1970 was a relatively brief uh, period, the, the, the heart of it, the, the main public part of it, but a very deep stimulation and transformation so that we saw people being transformed from being Negroes to being African, not just being black, but being African, which is even a step beyond being black because some of us find it easier to call ourselves by a color rather than a definition that is ethnic because black is not ethnic, black is broad but African puts us in a certain, uh, a, a different mind frame, a different setting where it links us to our ancestry in a way that black does not. Um, so so I, I just wanna say this at the, at the outset. Now what 1970 did was reach into the, the hearts and minds 
of our people in a way that the systems established to reach us did not reach us at that time. In fact, they were not designed to reach us in that way. We had the formal education system that was meant to continue perpetuate the destruction of our minds. We had a media that had no, uh, they, they were part of the destructiveness as well. And not because anybody was bad mind necessarily. You would have those who know what they're doing, but it is not because of bad minded people. It is because of the way we had all been brought up, the things we had been taught and the worship of, of whiteness in all forms that had been instilled into us from slavery coming right through. But I don't need to say these things to this, to this, com to this company. What Black Power did was to make people feel differently about themselves. Knowledge was a key to it. It was knowledge, historical knowledge. It was also understanding of our context, the situation in which we found ourselves in 1970. As a, as a collective, where did we stand in the economy? Where did we stand? Well, we, we thought we stood tall in the politics because we had leaders who looked like us. But we knew that we were, I don't even have to say we were marginalized in the economy. I think our situation was beyond marginalization. We were, we were virtually, we were right outside of it almost. Um, and then even more detrimental and what I think is more critical is our image of ourselves. And Black Power had an appeal because it didn't just deal with the economics, it didn't just deal with the politics, it really dealt with the person, the inner person and who we were, which was reflected in the way we behaved in relation to ourselves, in relation to others, uh, the people we saw as our heroes, the universe of knowledge, which was really a universe of misinformation in, in which we lived. So we didn't like our physical selves too much. We ourselves used the term black invariably in a negative way when it came to people like ourselves. We had terms like picky head, because we didn't particularly like the hair type we were born with. And we had a lot of negative concepts of self. We assumed that others, particularly whites, were more intelligent than us and all of, you know, we grew up with such notions and we felt that something was intrinsically wrong with us. At least that is what, that is what we were being Thought. That is what was coming from the media, that is what was coming from the education system itself. It is sad that up to today, it is very difficult for our youngsters to find positive information in the education system today. I was appalled last year when, was it last year or year before, when a new book for infants came out in the primary schools and enlisting festivals. And of course, this one is something that I would know very easily because of, you know, my part with emancipation. And you listed all kinds of festivals, including Valentine's Day. And emancipation was not listed. And all of us know that one of the largest festivals in Trinidad and Tobago is the annual emancipation festival. And how could a school book come up? and leave out that festival. Whether you like it or don't like it is not the point, is that a lot of people are part of it. And, and, and that is a marker of where we stand in the education system and the continuing miseducation of our people. I look at our media now. Um, and brother brother Cambon, if you don't mind, let me, let me just ask you to pause there mm -hmm. um, because you, you are making some very, very valid points. I don't want them to escape from us. And I, I want to invite um, Alan Kierwood to respond to you and to respond in particular to some of the points you have already made without us losing all of the points. Now you've spoken, Brother Cambon, about transformation. And a lot of what you said had to do with personality transformation, if I, if I attempt 
to see if I could synthesize what you're saying. I would say person rather than person. Personality more superficial. I would say person rather than person. person. Okay, okay. Yeah. I, I, I accept that. But I am saying, and, and I, I, I want to posit this. Of course, one of the, the things I want to say too is that in speaking, you were saying that you didn't need to say some things because you felt that you were preaching to the converted. I just wanted to remind you that we've got an audience. So it's not just the four of us. It's not just the four, the four of us in the room, right? So, so there might be occasions when you would need to preach, right? I just wanted you to bear that in mind. And it is in that context I'm asking Alan Kierwood to examine some of what um, Kafra Kambon has been saying about the person being changed. But Kambon and his colleagues, their attempt to do it, they reached the mind. And maybe another kind of action was necessary to get the sustained thing that I started talking about. And Mr. Herewood, your approach, I suspect, but correct me if I'm wrong, was a little bit different because at one time you were in ranks with um, Brother Cambon and company, and then you chose another path. So maybe you could say, by way of introduction, um, why this path and how is your quote unquote philosophy different from Kafra Cambon's philosophy? Well, I would um, have to say good night, everybody, and see mm -hmm. whatever part of you are. Um, <clears throat> that the movement towards armed revolution came because of the response of the authorities. It wasn't something that we had chosen to do initially. But when we saw what was happening to the soldiers, which was of major concern, that these men had stood up for African people and Indian people who were going to be brutalized by the police. And they wanted to put a stop to that. And when we recognized that these people were being really badly treated in the so-called justice system, that something had to be done to help them, at least to give them some hope that one day they would, not, they would be exoner exonerated from what has taken place. Um, the unity that was achieved um, in 1970, they called for Indians and Africans to unite because it was not just an African story. Um, there was a unity that took place among African people and I say on others um, that did not remain. And African people over the years have drifted apart again. We you know, um, see ourselves as Afro Trinidadian and Afro Bajan and Afro American. There's this disconnect that the establishment has encouraged. So we, we no longer see ourselves as just African by genetics then, but African in the sense of where we are. We only both drop off our four parents. So if you both stop in America or stop in Brazil or stop in Barbados, that's has become important, more important than our Africanness. Um, so today, you reach the point of you live on the other side of the street, so that's a division. Or you from up the hill and I from down the hill, and that becomes a division. And a divided people have nowhere to go. We cannot confront anybody as divided as we are. And the media, we have the HBOs and whatnot who perpetuate this type of stuff. So the younger ones coming up think, well, look, they have to be in that way. And you look at your own people as your enemy. Um, I think we have gone down in a deeper hole than we were in even before and we left it um, with that lack of unity. And it is something that um, we have to work on. The response of the government in the 1970s to 
Mais le Conseil suprême de Bruno, en le chargé de Bruno, en le de Bruno, en le chargé de Bruno, en le chargé de de Bruno, en le chargé de Bruno, en le mimic European society as opposed to what we are really made of. And those without the resources try to mimic those with the resources. And of course, we know that um, a lot of black businessmen, their friends are not black people, are not African people, especially if you go to Africa anyhow. Um, are not really people of African descent. They would link with who got money like them. There's a disconnect to where you came from. Um, that has hindered our progress big time. Okay. Is, it, is, it, is it possible, Mr. Herewood, I just want you to say just a bit more. Is there a simple answer because we're getting to one of the issues that are, I'm hoping we will explore a bit further? Disunity. Um, you hinted at the unity that was, that we experimented with in 1970 with Indians and Africans. But I am now hearing you saying that the Africans today in Trinidad and in the wider Caribbean they are not even together. Um, is there a simple solution? How do you write that? How do you correct it? It, it isn't a simple solution. No, there is no simple solution because it's not a simple way that that happened. That was a very complex, well thought out plan by the rulers. And to counteract that, we're going to have to dig deep into our consciousness, into our own mind, and try to get where we could use the social media now, and try to use that to try to write that problem. We no longer have to depend on the normal media, the newspapers, and the box for have you. That has been painting us in a wrong, with a wrong brush all the time, and making us feel that this difference exists. There's no difference. So in that sense, we, we look into an uh, easy answer eventually, but the question is very difficult to deal with. Right. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Merle Hodge, mm -hmm. you've been an educator for all of your life, I think, in, in whatever sphere of activity. Um, how do we address the disunity? Can education help? Has education failed us? Okay. Um, now, now the, the disunity that we're talking about is the disunity among Africans, not necessarily, with, right? But um, yes, I, I, yeah. I am. I am taking it from from what Mr. Hayward was talking about. Yes. Eventually, he was making the point that if your African brother lives opposite the street from you, or if your Africa, African brother has a thousand dollars more than you, he doesn't see the need to unify himself with you. So yes. it's that, that, that kind of disunity I'm talking about. In the first instance, shouldn't we first unite ourselves before we begin thinking about uniting ourselves with, you know, with the rest of the globe? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think perhaps that we are, well, in, in the first place, I think I'm a, li a little more optimistic than, than, than um, the, the, the brother eh, about, about improvements in our mindset and our, our, our attitudes to, to ourselves. But one of the things that we are not only ourselves, I mean, not only African people have lost is the, the, uh, the business of working together, of um, this, the sense of, of community. You know, and, and perhaps this, this, this was one of the most beautiful things about the Grenada Revolution, how the, the prevailing, um, you know, the, the ideas that, that were floating and the kinds of programs that were then got people to, 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 to actually work together on their own 
problems and the, the problems of their, their community. The, I think they, I, but I mean, I can just say that I think perhaps it Trinidad and Tobago, the population of Trinidad and Tobago in general is very individualistic. Okay, and, and we, we, we have to, to a large extent lost that whole sense of, of, um, of community about advancing the community rather than, sorry, rather than just just yourself but we but the brother spoke about education you know there's a lot of of um of attitude education that has to, to take place with with perhaps with the people who who, who, who teach children as well with, with with adults and these these um these, these these problems are solved when children see see adults acting in a particular way and see adults and hear the the, the the um the philosophies of adults um but but i'm also more optimistic than than you know the, the previous speakers are about the business of a, well perhaps not I, I needn't you know i needn't say that i'm all, all that much more optimistic but i've i'm seeing the developments in terms of our of of, of african people in particular their attitude to, to their 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 body body image and all, all of these all of this is part of it when we operated under a complete inferiority complex um i don't think that 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 makes makes um you know the business of respecting each other and getting along and getting together on the the uh, upliftment of of the, the the whole community rather than than your own but but i just want to make two two little comments which is to say go, going back to, to, to that whole, whole idea of of a body image that that brother Kamban spoke about. Now I'm seeing I'm I'm I think that we are now. Remember I I've been around as we say I've been down here long. I was born in 1944. When I left Trinidad and Tobago at the age of 18, all of those things, all of those problems here with our vision of ourselves were were were, were rife, right? And then when I came back home, the Black Power movement had done a, a lot of its work and I began to see see changes. And I think that today, 50 years after Black Power, we might be a little less rejecting of our skin color. And you know that that, that idea appears in, in the, the, the Bible, the, the biblical curse of, of Ham. And, and you know, I'm, the present company is, as you, you pointed out, are aware of those things. But you know, all, all of these things can, can you know, they, they, they bear saying, more than once. Um, in in terms of our hair, I think that perhaps is what is the you know is a big revolution. Um, in my time, when I was a child growing up, people called you our hair. In in Patwa, Shive Tak Tak. I don't know if any of you are aware of that expression. Shive is hair, and Tak Tak is that black ant, an ant which is as big as a bachak that goes croop, croop, croop. So, I mean, that was not supposed to be a complimentary, um, you know, comment. So, and there was a bad hair versus good hair. I remember when in 1966, when I was at London University, I had to be, at, with the, I was doing French, so they sent us to the continent, to, you know, to go to France and all that. When I came back after about half a year, I met one of my colleagues. When I say so, but I met a, a compatriot a man you know and when he's i had stopped it was just too too difficult to do the hair straightening and thing over there you you know they, they it's, it's not a part of life there so so i just stopped straightening my hair and when this man saw me he said wow you're playing miriam makeba it was as bad as that right that you you, you had to be, be be playing something it is unthink was unthinkable for a self-respecting woman to walk about with her hair natural on process but i'm thinking that today we have i mean and this is emerging out of the, the black power um revolution we, we have we have reclaimed a wealth of of african hairdressing all right um the hair straightening still exists but today it is one among a range of options it is not an obligation all right and the wonderful thing there too is how Young men have have also owned a uh, um, hair plaiting. All right, I I forgot to say in terms of this this skin color thing, this this shade thing, the advertising industry here I'm afraid has not caught on yet. 
that dark skinned people can also be be a firm part of advertising. I don't know if you, you've you've noticed that, but the models, the people who appear in advertisements are still the the kind of 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 brown, you know, that you don't really see either dark Africans or dark Indian Indians in in those things. So that's an area. Um, our nose. I'm I'm just, you know, I, I this, these are the things I thought of when I got this invitation that I need to. To, to share with people. When I was a child, some mothers and grandmothers used to massage the baby's nose. I don't know if you're aware of that. Massage your nose and pull it and slap it and all kind of things so that it would become a quote unquote straight nose, right? That is to say a nose that protrudes rather than what we saw as flat by comparison to other noses. I don't think we have that kind of <laughs> complex anymore. And then I want to make an important point here, important to me, the, the anatomy of the female African, right? Has not always been a thing of pride. The, way, way back, I don't know when it started, but we, the whole society and African people included, used to call the women of the PNM, the Afri you know, the majority African party, the PNM, you know what we used to call them, the Fat Ass Brigade, right? But today the Afro-Caribbean woman is saying, this Bumsi is mine. I, I have heard about a Calypso that has that line in it, but I haven't been able to track it down, right? Um, so, so that, um, the, you know, all, all the, this, this, today the, the, the African woman has reclaimed, you know, but the, ah, look, I mean, that, that is not, you know, we, we no longer come under the beauty um, criteria that we we adopted from, from, from white people. Then the naming of children with African names, both the naming of children with African names and, and adults changing their name legally in, into African names, that that is still there. That, that has be, become a, a permanent part of, of our, our, our life. All right, so, so that I wanted to, to just establish that in terms of our individual um, attitudes for, to, 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 to ourselves, but I think that there, there has to be a, an, an overall change of attitude in terms of, of, of people acting as community, right? And I'm, I, I don't, I'm not so sure that that is only to do with, with, with African people. I think uh, that that is just something we, we will have to, to reclaim. Um, okay. I, if, if you permit me, Merle, I, mm -hmm. I would like you, for the purpose of, of the, the conversation, mm -hmm. you, you made the point about how individualistic, if I translate mm -hmm. what you said, yeah. mm -hmm. Trinidadians tend to be vis-a-vis -vis Grenadians and your... Oh, oh, no, no, no. And, no, no. Well, as, you, you mean as, as opposed to, because it's not as, an attitude as, to Grenadians. Yeah, yeah, no, as opposed as, to. Right. As opposed um, to. Yeah, okay. So I just wanted you to just share a little bit more of your experience in Grenada yes. and the positive things that you saw that may be in terms yes. of writing that yes. Trinidadians could begin to look at. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay. Well, the Grenada Revolution encouraged the very, very vigorously encouraged from the very beginning, the formation of groups, the formation of groups, as well as people joining existing groups, the people were encouraged to, to operate, you know, out of an organization. And there were many. And in, in the, the, the community that I lived in, I, I, I was a part of the, the National Women's Organization, which had which had um, chapters all, all over the country. I found myself in road building. When, when, when roads had, had to be repaired, people rolled out who could cook, would cook for everybody. And I am much of a cook, so I had to help with, with the, the actual work or, or just cleaning a community it is in the schools. When the school was about to open, they would get the community to come out and give the school a, a, a clean and, um, People in the community who had carpentry skills would would fix the the furniture. <laughs> All schools have this problem of furniture breaking up, so they they would they would fix the furniture. Um, there were also structures being developed. In fa in fact, just when everything fell down, they they had got to a really um, 
interesting stage of developing structures of consultation and people sharing their concerns about community with the leadership. There was always a very close relationship between leadership and 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 people, and people would, would roll out. For instance, they, they started with parish councils. The other Caribbean islands tend to be divided and put focus on parish. I don't think we 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 have that kind of um you know geographical division here but people would people of a particular parish parish would roll out to a building in the nearest school or and there would be discussions there there would be reports about problems in in communities what what had if if there had been problems before and they would all they the the, the people running the meeting the leadership running the meeting would always bring technical people, like people from what was the the counterpart of, of the TNTEC, the Electricity Commission, and people would be able to report to them if, if there were problems, you know, that people working in the utilities could, could attend to. And then um, in, in, in the next parish council meeting, there would be a report on what had been done on that. You know, there, there, there was just this major... Um, thrust for people to work together to, to solve their own problems at the level of the, the, the community. Okay, and, and, and there's, there's, there's a story I always tell. My, my son, when we went there, he was four years old. And one day I met him in, in the, the bathroom, rubbing the walls with some piece of cloth. I said, what are you doing there? He said, I doing community work. <laughs> you see, so right. ch ch children were growing up in this atmosphere of, of owing the community something, owing the community some of your 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 um your your energy as as it were and you know one of the things that that came out of Grenada and it came out pretty pretty early is that Grenadians began to feel much prouder of themselves than before Grenada had a kind of um i i don't know there there was a certain amount of of um embarrassment about its it's 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 you know it's state I, well i'm i'm not too sure what it was based on but i heard people saying that Grenada can hold its head up now Grenada also the revolution also inspired people who had writing talents out of the revolution came writers like merle collins a, a, a major writer and a well he was then young i was going to say a young man but at the time jacob ross and and others they are um a great deal of 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 attention was was given to the the arts as well i remember one time a whole delegation came from here errol jones and to springer and a lot of people and they, they those um grenadians came out in full force each each time and and i'm told i think it, it was into that errol jones was speaking to and he was almost in tears at the way that he had been received he had never in his life been received in quite that warm way in in his performances in Trinidad and Tobago, so it, so I think it is to, to do with the, the injection of the community spirit, and and it was sustained, which is which it was is sustained, the, oh, which yes, is the point you're making. Yes, oh yes, it, it was sustained because it became a way of life. You know, it wasn't something you just read in a book or somebody gave you the, the 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 idea. It was something that people got into with all their heart. Yeah, which uh -huh. which which, which yes. Yeah, thank you very much, Mul, and mm -hmm. and I want to come back to to Brother Cambon, but just before he speaks, I would like the participants to know that they can post questions. You can simply post the question in the chat, and um, I would take the question at the appropriate time. And it could be general questions, or you can post questions to individual members of the panel. Um, just before you pause. On the last occasion you spoke, Brother Cameron, you were making a point about the influence of the media. And, and I want to ask you to take up that point one more time. But in dealing with it, I would also want you to stretch yourself a bit and look at the issue of unity, bearing in mind that we want to talk about writing, um, correcting things. So... I want you to talk about the media, yes, but rather than only state the problem, if you could attempt to point the way that we ought to go to revolutionize and correct what is currently taking place. Brother Cambon. Okay, well, 
in terms of correcting what is taking place, you need things at, uh, at, at several levels. Uh, the media is a very critical one. I don't think, however, that the media is going to change much unless we are able to start shaping an environment among, the, among it. And, and that is the established media. Because fortunately now there is another media apart from the established media. The thing is that the established media still has a tremendous amount of influence. And I suppose they would only move away from that when they become dominated by what we call broadly the, the social media and all of that. But you see, you need to have a vibe in the society that is consistent with the development of the society in all, in all its aspects. And where there are institutions that have to serve us as a people, because the media are not a bit private enterprise. The government has its own media as well, but it doesn't function as much, uh, well, I don't know. I, I, it, it, it doesn't function much differently so far. But the fact that the government has media, the same way Merle spoke about what was taking place in Grenada, is that the government controlled media in Grenada was part of the process of the education of the people. We can't say the same for the media that is in Trinidad and Tobago. Even the government controlled media as a matter, as a matter of fact. But I want to look at the education system as something that is so critical. And since education is largely in the hands of the state, we really need to push the state to transform that education system. How could we have an education system that is still allowing people like us, the Africans in the society in particular, to graduate at the highest levels without having a positive sense of self where ethnicity is concerned. And that is still happening to a very large extent based on the interactions that I have that, that I have with people. And we have from the earliest levels, and I mentioned where you don't have something, a festival like emancipation, not included. And do you know that even in the PNM manifesto, this year they listed festivals and did not list emancipation. This year when the, um, when the Ministry of, of Culture put out its, its, its calendar of events on the internet, we had to go into the ministry and point out to them that they listed festivals in Trinidad and Tobago without listing the Emancipation Festival. Let, let me ask a question. Mr. The psychological awareness we're talking about. Yeah, but let me ask a question as, as, as you mentioned it. Um, must the government push the image of self? Supposing the government does not push the image of self, will we not improve our image? And there are other avenues? Do we have to wait on the state to do it? I'm, I'm, I'm asking you, well, well, I am asking you a direct question. If you, if you could. Two things, two things you don't. We don't have to wait on the state, but the state has to respond to us. But you have to build a certain level of consciousness at a broad level to get the state to respond. Because the people who get the state to respond are either those who have the money to help a government win elections, um, or, you know, or, or people who have other kinds of, 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 of influences. But when it comes to a broad mass of people, you have to be organized to a level that the state has to pay attention. So you may have a government, and, and we know the racial division in the, in the politics, which is very fundamental to it, particularly between Africans and Indians in terms of how that fits in with the particular structure of parties. And the African community, the self-consciousness that would make us put uh, a premium 
on some things is not there. And the difference between Africans and Indians in this society is, is that historical systematic efforts at the erasure of African identity. It is very difficult up to today for many of us to define ourselves as African. And, and that has to do with the whole process from enslavement. You don't need to go through all of that. But why it still continues is because it continues in the images, in the media, it continues in most of the information sources in the society. And it continues in the education system itself, the formal education system itself. So when you have some things like the Emancipation Festival, when you have some of the things organized by the people who have kept their Yoruba culture strongly alive and all of that, these things don't reach um, the, the, the majority of our people with the depth it should. I think the Emancipation Festival is the most powerful African projection that you have in the society. But even that is not strong enough and you need a continuous reinforcement of the messages of 1970, where the African is concerned because the, the messages of 1970, and that is why you know our definitions of black would be a little different. Because for me, black is not my identity. Black is a political identity. I am, I, I am an African. I'm, I'm very clear about that. I'm not just a black person. I am African. And we look at what happened in 1970. When the, when the Black Power Movement brought people together, it didn't say that when, it, when, when we reach out, the Africans that is reach out to Indians as our black brothers, we were not calling them African. We were recognizing and accepting the Indian identity. So blackness was, a, was not like it was defined in the United States, it was a different kind of political definition altogether and recognizing the uniqueness of each people and not challenging each other's culture. But if, we, if, if people are going through an education system and even learning from it in their own households before they reach into the formal system, some of the things that Moore spoke about, which some of them have gone by the wayside, but some of it is still there because many of today's parents still don't know any better. And that is why 1970 reached a certain pinnacle. But how do you sustain it? How do you sustain that? It was sustained in, for the period of 1970 and for some time after, but in a period when people are mobilized. And then you use the force that, 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 that put the soldiers in jail, that put, the people, that put others in the prison, that killed others and all of that. And, and, and you begin to suppress all the avenues for mass mobilization. These avenues were systematically suppressed. And therefore the media started to regain an upper hand. The, the media was diminished. The formal media was diminished in 1970. Because the, the, the platform, the Black Power platform, was the main source of information and people were galvanizing towards it. That is why they broke down that kind of communication. So we have to find ways to force changes in some of the formal systems in the society now. And I would pinpoint in the education system and the media as critical. Because we still have to be, up to this year, we, and I'm talking about the Emancipation Support Committee, have had to fight issues over here in schools. Some of them have been very public, like the one with that sister, the, the, the daughter of the, 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 of, of the cricketer down in the South, who was, was taught here by the principal and other teachers in the school because of the way she wore her natural hair. And we have a number of those issues. You know, Once we had somebody on our radio program in Daba, and it was a, a white boy who came on. And he came on on behalf of the person who sits next to him in St. Mary's College. This was last year. And he came on because the black boy who was suffering was afraid to come on. Because this, the white boy had his hair long. And he said that 
he's sitting next to this guy and is here just a little high, the, 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 the African child. And he's being harassed to cut his hair. And he said, he tells her, but look at my hair. But they wouldn't take him on because he's white, he's untouchable. So these are some of the realities that are still going on in this society. And what we are talking about is mind change. And mind change requires continuous stimulation, continuous information. Somebody can't just hear something positive and then it sustains them. You can't just get a positive vibe out of something and nothing else reinforces that vibe. And when it comes to business, I would say this, that in any community, business, that, that's like a class by itself. But the one, but the people who have less sense of building things that have to do with the mind and the consciousness when they are in business are people in our own community. I could tell you that in the National Joint Action Committee in the post-Black Power period, that a lot of the African businesses that benefited directly, directly, directly from what sacrifices that people like Harewood made, uh, people like us in the National Joint Action Committee made, and so many people made those, those, those sacrifices. And when you try to hold something, like even if you're going to try to have a lecture, and you want to bring down somebody with some power, like a Dr. Benji Cannon or somebody, and you cannot get, we could not get an African businessman who would say, I would pay the passage for the person to come. And I'm talking about immediately. I'm talking like 1971, 1972. You could not get that kind of, you could not get that kind of support because based on class or whatever it is, but some people remained outside of what had taken hold of the imagination of the masses. And therefore finding ways to sustain it was difficult. We have a challenge now with our African history quiz, which you introduced into the school because you know um, you had a friend. Just, just before you go on to that, I, um, Brother Cambon, if you don't mind, um, I, I, I want to ask Alan here to respond to you. You see, you spoke in terms of the media in particular. There are two points. So before you go on to the third one with the emancipation and the history quiz, and we'll come back to that, you, you raised the issue of the media and education, and you used the word force. Um, Alan Harewood's history seems to be centered around that kind of revolution as distinct from the other kind of revolution that I believe Brother Cambon is talking about. Um, my point is, there has been 50 years of the attempt to change the minds, look at the education system, look at the media, and it has not worked. And that's why I want to ask Alan Harewood, and I'm now talking about November 2020, the methods that you chose to use back in 1969, 70, 71, um, Mr. Harewood. Do you see the need for those methods now? Um, because I want to make the point that um, I am not as optimistic as Merle. So I want to make the point that maybe in some ways we are failing. And you know, there's a famous saying about doing the same thing over and over and it keeps failing. Why are we doing it that way? Why don't we do it your way, Mr. Harewood? Well, I would say, well, one thing times have changed. Um, the technology today is a lot more sophisticated than it was in the 1970s. And I do think um, standing up in large groups to try and stop the government is that plausible. Um, maybe we have to use the same education and but but aren't you aren't you suggesting that we just throw our hands up in the air and give no, up? Is, is no, 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 of course is not. It, 
Of course not. There's a fight ahead of us. There's a fight ahead of us, but the fight is not is going to be different. Um, we have to use technology in this fight. Um, you can't just go and take up arms, let us say, and try to confront people who are going to have heat seeking missiles and this kind of thing. I'm going to kill you from a thousand miles away. You know, um, we have to recognize that we have to be into the technology as well to protect ourselves and to protect um, what we want to build, what, what, what we see as the outcome of where black people, African people should be going. And we need a level of education and te technical abilities to accomplish this. Um, Fictitiously thinking, I always think of um, if we could just get on a computer and destroy all the nuclear missiles in the world, because they're all operated by computers, and maybe one day we might get some black man to hack into that system and do something like that. Um, we need technology on our side, and we are very capable when it comes to that. Um, as regards of what I consider looking for gifts from the establishment. Anything that is given to you is going to be taken back. Um, you see that in the 1970s, a lot of industries in Trinidad were nationalized. And where are they today? They, they no longer belong. We used to say belong to us, you know, the people. But they no longer belong to the people. A lot of people get fat oppressed and pull their pockets. And they're now being sold back to the private sector. And so anything that is given to you without you fighting for it is not going to last. They're going to be taken back. People try to win elections and take over their country. They're going to change this and change that. You can look at South America and Chile and get them. Bolivia, Venezuela, Chile, with Ali and they, it gets you nowhere. If you don't fight for something, you're not going to fight for people, you know. You know, they didn't fight for the, for the revolution. You know. They did a lot of great things when they took the country. But when it came to fight to keep it, they didn't fight to keep it in because they didn't fight to get it in it closely. We, we, we are not strong enough, perhaps, Mr. Hayward. Um, when you say we, <laughs> you know, we, we, no, no, yeah, we, we as a people, because <laughs> there, there are two fundamental points being made. We, we started to address the issue of unity and disunity. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, the disunity, the fact that we, we are not together, then <laughs> perhaps we will not be strong enough. Yes, I agree with you. Yes, and that is where the ground will come. We need to get some, I think, and that should be more in a position than that, to push a lot of Black African thinking people into the teaching profession. And maybe if we have a fair enough and enough amount of teachers who think in a particular way, this could be imparted to the younger ones coming up. And how do, how do you get these teachers to think in this particular kind of way? Which is a question I was raising yes, in, a, in, a, in a different kind of way to Brother Cambon just now. Yeah, as you said before, but we need that in our education of the children, right? So we'll probably be looking at children in secondary school now who will become teachers in the next five, eight years. So they have to be educated now because it, it, that, that, that education is there, but not widespread. We need it a little more widespread among certain people who go into the education. I did. It shouldn't be. So the education system is where it all starts. And we have been, our education system just educate people to go and work for the establishment. And they don't teach us how to build factories and run factories and do business. They don't teach us that in school. That is left, that is kept secret and taught among families who are into business and they will train their children to take over the business. But in our, in our school system, there's nothing that prepares us to do anything else but to go and work for 
the established class of capitalists and so on. So we have to change that into a level of teachers who are genuinely going to, apart from the curriculum, impart that love of self to our children. Um, we have a couple of questions and we have a comment. And I want to see if I could throw at um, Dr. Hodge, Dr. Hodge, um, well, three things. First, there's a compliment, Dr. Hodge, for your um, understanding, your assessment, as it were, of the black body that you made in the initial statement you made. And then there's the question that is posed to us that has to do with the media um, presenting racist, I believe the questioner meant, anti-African presentations. And how do we, as black people, if the media presents images or stories that are racist or anti-African, how do we deal with that? And just permit me to say to those posing questions, um, try to be a little more succinct. Um, we, we, we have some questions that are eight and nine and 10 lines long. It's difficult to read those and answer them on this kind of forum. So I want to ask, please, if you could just shorten the question so we get the point. So um, Dr. Hodge, the question about the media, right? If the media does, and we recognizing from what Brother Cambon is saying, and we are agreeing with that, that the media is in control of the people's mind, and one has to get at the media, and the media perpetuates racist biases, if you could call it that. Um, Dr. Hodge, um, how, how does one attempt to deal with that? And of course, the, the question that also comes out from that, is education really the way, or might there not be another possibility? Dr. Hodge. Yes, okay. Um, sorry, the, the original question you asked me was how to deal with that. Well, I suppose people, people um, and, and so you, you're talking about the mainstream media. You're not talking about we, social we talking, media. We're so. talking about, yes, yeah, sorry. Mainstream we talk, media, yeah. yeah. Yes. The adjective, okay. the adjective. The, the okay, media. well, but, but pe pe when, when those things happen, people generally start up conversations and, and ar arguments about them. Um, you, I don't know if, you, if you, you're suggesting what they, they're doing with the with the social media internationally cleaning them up, removing things that are seen as as hate, hate mail and, and that 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 kind of thing. Is is that is that what, what we're thinking of? And when you say when it presents racist things, you mean letters to the editor and so? Um the 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 um the the, the person who asked the question mm -hmm. was making was making reference to a story that appeared recently. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Right? And I believe the question is asking, because I said the question was quite long, but the question mm -hmm. was asking, when you have situations like that, mm -hmm. those of us who are black or African and conscious enough, do we have a role in pointing out these things, highlighting them, and um, maybe developing a kind of quote-unquote weaponry to deal with it? Yeah, but but you know, every, everybody has to to speak out for things that they stand for, not not leave them for for anybody else to solve. I mean, people should be reacting all the time to all the things that are going on around them that that offend them. Um, and in terms of education now, um, official education, right? Um, there, there there's a, a a little story I tell now and then of a, a, a friend who is a teacher educator, was a teacher educator, because this is way back in the 80s or 90s, who told us that she went to a classroom to supervise a lesson. And the lesson was about what the different ethnic groups here have contributed to Trinidad and Tobago and Trinidad and Tobago's culture. And then so children put up their hand and talked about what the Chinese have brought and what the Spanish have brought and the French and the English and the this and the that. And then when she, and she said, okay, what about the African people? And the children were mute, okay? 
<laughs> the children did not have a thing to offer um, to, to offer in terms of what African people have brought here. Um, I just want to say that that business of self knowledge is something that we're taking a long time to, um, you know, climb out of because our original mode on this side of the world was self flight. The whole thing about not not respecting your body image and not not um, having a strong and grounded sense of of yourself. Now, um, the you know it's a it's it's a question of school. As you see, all right, we we have a a, a multiracial society, all right, and as I I guess we we are the ones with the the, the weakest self image. I don't know, all right. But what, what I want to say about the education system is that it needs to bring education home uh, um, a lot more. And a part of home is, 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 is Af African culture here as well as Indian culture. And well as, I don't know, they, they, I am suggesting that, that cultural studies can, can help here, eh? that um, we, we perhaps the developer when i say cultural studies i don't mean the well what what goes on in cultural studies in the world and i suppose even even here i don't really understand it seems a fairly abstract and academic thing but i think that little modules could be be made for children in school to talk about what 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 culture is here when you ask people here about culture they'll give you a lot of information about steelban and calypso people don't really understand that there's a lot more to it mm -hmm. than that um, proverbs, traditional stories, food, hairdressing, medicine, religions, languages, patterns of family, they're all kinds of things that fall under culture. And, um, and also the, the business of history, history, I don't know what is, what, whether this has been changed or rectified, but you know that um, at one stage in the education system years ago, and I'm saying, I don't know, I, I can't speak for what is happening now because I haven't sort of looked in on that for a long time. History was removed and um, and I think geography, and I think a nebulous thing that is called social studies replaced it. Social studies doesn't have to be nebulous, but social studies is not a strong enough focus on, on, on culture, All right? Um, so, so that the, the history of the, the subject history in the, the school cu curriculum is a, a very in, interesting thing to, to study. At first, it was, when I was in school, it, all you got was the history of England. And even up to independence, I put my hand on one of my son's um, his history books when he was at St. George's, you know, so that and St. George's is just a part of the education system. You take orders from the Ministry of Education. <laughs> one such a thing about a, a history book written for English children, British children, with all kinds of things that really have nothing to do with us here. I will also say that in the 19th in the early 1970s, I picked up a history book. It may have been one of his as well, or maybe maybe it was when I was in Jamaica, and I got hold of this book written by West Indians, I think. And in it, just to give you an example of what has happened with what has been going on with history, there was a there was this history book, and in one of the chapters there was the story of a particular revolt against slavery. African people, you know, they. There were a number of quite famous re re revolts, and there was a particular one that was that was described in this history book. And at the end of the narrative about that, there was the sentence be because it was suppressed, of course, as as, as it generally happened. And the narrative, the writer of that history book for Caribbean children wrote, "quote open quotation marks." And after that, the slaves gave no further trouble. That, that shocked me to, to the core. That is the perspective a writer of history, mo most likely an African person in the Caribbean would, would, would give children that these, these people who, people still just refer to as the slaves as if it's some kind of extraterrestrial people that were floating around here, nothing to do with them, right? Um, so, so, so that, um, you know, I, I am suggesting that there needs to be a lot more work on, on culture as it, well, both, both history. All right, in terms of history, what we learned when Caribbean history started to come in, we got it from the point of view of the, the, um, the colonial powers. 
all right and you there was a lot of stuff about what island was traded between england and france when they, when they they make their treaty for that war there was very little it seemed to me and that is what we still need to do history that 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 shows children how people live then what kinds of struggles they had and what they used to eat and 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 and, and all of that right so i am thinking that it, at one one of these days we're going to get together and put together some cultural studies modules that show you what it what the what culture is here of course we have a diversity of cultures but you also have a core a sort of core of all of that 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 everybody participates in and you could have little modules that either f focus on the input input of a, a specific ethnic group into into our culture or you you have you have a, a general thing that talks about these things like proverbs and traditional stories and food and all those kinds of things but you see um in 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 our situation when i say oh i mean in the the the, the post colonial situation i suppose or i don't know the more we the more educated you are the less you know well this is a caribbean problem right because people in africa and india and, and other places that, that were not dragged out of their context and brought elsewhere they still have some some kind of um, view of the their traditional cultures that that have not been completely dis destroyed but um th there there needs to be some focus on putting together things for children to to read and learn in school about what what culture is here there there are, there are all kinds of things and what i'm saying is that the more educated you are the less you know about some of these things west indian proverbs and i think you know in retrospect now we can see how important it was what um that that thing that the, the best village thing that eric williams started because a lot of songs that would have disappeared by now right. if they hadn't if people hadn't actually gone and collected them and sung them in these areas and i think that work in in the in the, in the culture cultural sphere in terms of the broad definition of culture which is way of life that is that is um, ne needed. Children also need to read a lot more West Indian literature because it, it is in the literature of your society that you see yourself, that builds an, an, an image of, of yourself. So, so I mean, there, there, are, there are a number of things to be done. The American children and French children find out who they are from, from literature, all right, right? from, from right. fiction. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of questions. And, um... And I, I, I want to say, you know, I want to say to my fellow um, colleagues on the panel, please, you know, don't, you don't need to wait on me to point to you if you feel there is something you want to say. Um, um, you know, you can respond, but I, I want to put some of the questions out. So one of the questions from um, one of the participants um, what do we, are we saying that Indians are black? Um, that's the, que the question. The person wants to find out when we say black, do we also mean Indians? So that's one of the questions. I don't know which of my three colleagues would like to tackle that. Well, I was sec hold, 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 hold. Yeah. Sorry, but I, I, want, I want to put out the other question as okay. well. Mm -hmm. The other question, and again, anyone can, can tackle that question. To what extent is Christianity to be blamed for the predicament, quote unquote, in which we found ourselves? So, Merle, we will go with you first with the African Indian question. Yes, are, in, are Indians think, black? Are I Indians think, black? I think groups of people need, need to be given the space to define themselves. I, I, I am not going, 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 going to tell a, a, an ethnic group what, 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 they, what they call themselves. And the, the, the second question there, Christianity, that I wanted to say earlier on that one of the things children, African children as well as all other children need to, to learn about here is each other's religion. But of course, with, with Christian, a part of Christianization was to, to wipe out your, your, your religion, civilize it out of you. And, and the, the bad name that African religions in particular have got in the, in, in the Caribbean is something that needs to be, be, be rectified. So our the you know African religions that were were brought here they have seeded well I, the, 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 let me just say they so people will think are attacking Christians the whole society but society was you know based to 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 a large extent on European religion um, 
we have been, African people have been made to see the religions that they brought from Africa as devil worship. And this op- Africans don't even have any curiosity about, when I say Africans, those who don't already belong to, to, to such a, a religion, don't, don't actually have much curiosity about them. Right. And, and, um, and there are certain parents who would be, be quite horrified if you started to let children get a peep into those religions in, in school. Right. But and anyway, it's it's um you know a, 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 a lot of what we are saying um, falls um, right where Brother Cambon was a couple of minutes ago. So mm-hmm. Brother Cambon, I'm giving you the space because yeah. I know I know you want to respond to two or three of the things. Mm-hmm. So feel free. Okay, I, let, let let me deal with this question of whether or not Indians are, are black. And I will talk specifically about the experience that I had with the Black Power Movement of 1970. Because when Black Power came into this society, hit this society with a, a, almost a cosmic force coming from the United States. And Black was seen in the United States specifically as as African. It came into a society where we ourselves, who are African, did not too much like the definition black. And far more the persons within the Indian community. And the truth is that black is not an ethnic definition in the way that African is or Indian is. And we put it in the context of a condition where persons who are non-white, who have been dominated for centuries by the white powers, those who have that actual power for such a long period and dominated in the worst kinds of ways, like chattel slavery and Trinidad and Tobago and Indian indentureship and all that. And therefore you have non-white groups in the society that have been really oppressed and also divided from each other. And we turn the idea of black into something that embraced the two major oppressed groups in the society, Africans and Indians. And I must say, it it did not present any challenge but because of the way we had operated, even before we spoke in terms of Black Power, that is the National Joint Action Committee, which I, which I was a part of at that time. The, the issues in which we had involved ourselves, not only in African community, because from 1969, shortly after we were formed, one of the first major issues that was tackled was an issue with cane farmers in an Indian community in Montserrat. That's one of the first issues that the National Joint Action Committee tackled in a major way. So you had a history of, of, of the things that were involved in that involved Indians. When the Black, when black power really became big in the, in the society, very dominant in the we made it clear that we were talking not just about Africans, but about Africans and Indians. And there were challenges to overcome because the symbols associated, not just with the term black, but the term black power, that combined term, were dominant from the United States. And they were strictly coming from the United States, African-centered images. And we therefore had to put a lot of effort into changing the meaning of that term in our context. My short answer to it would be according to the context and according to how one community reaches out to the other, it is not as great a challenge. It is not an impossible hurdle. The practical experience in Trinidad and Tobago is that it was no hurdle at all. Uh, um, I mean, it was a hurdle, but it was not a hurdle that could not have been crossed in 1970 because we did not tell somebody that it is a challenge to your Hinduism or your Islam or whatever other belief system 
you may have. It was a political definition of people who had a joint fight against white power. Because white power was the existing power in the world, white power continues to be existing power in the world. And, and if it is put into that kind of political context, then you don't have, don't have a problem, even though you people, people fight it on all kinds of issues. But you just look at the Karen map. And not only that, but when the government of Trinidad and Tobago declared a state of emergency, it was because a massive march was due on April 21st, 1970, coming out of the Indian heartland. Because a few days before April 21st, 1970, a group of sugar workers came up to the offices of the National Joint Action Committee in Denmark. And they were having problems with Padis Maraj, who was their union leader at the time. And they asked for his attention. And McCandle Dagger, Winston Leonard, Nuevo Diaz, and others went into the sugar belt. And within two days, brought down the entire sugar industry on strike. And on April 21st, the Indian sugar workers and their families were not only due to march into Port of Spain, they were actually assembled to march into Port of Spain, not knowing at the time that a state of emergency had already been, but it hadn't been declared. It was being put into force because by that time, people like myself and a few others were already locked up by four o'clock in the morning because they had decided to have a state of emergency on that day. See, a lot depends on the sincerity of leadership. A lot depends on the perspective in which things are put and the importance of the definition in a particular context. I myself don't just see myself as black. I am not defined by my color. My color is important. It has a certain projection. I am defined by my, his, my historical identity. My ancestors are Africans from the continent of Africa and my ethnic identity is African. My national identity is Trinidadian, my ethnic identity. So it is, a, it is a question of how you define and whether or not you have the capacity to get others to buy into that de definition in a particular situation. So you have to assess different situations and how things work. I, I also want to look at that question of that education system again and the question of things like uh, the in indigenous aspects of culture are important. It is also important to link them to the backgrounds from which they come. Because if we don't have a sense, you, you, you see, the colonial education, I'm not just talking about what they give us in the school, but what was put into our heads on the plantations and everything else was meant to cut us off from our past, from a sense of who we are, you know, to shallow our definition, of, not only make our definition of ourselves shallow in terms of cutting off our past, but giving us new, definition of ourselves. And it was very effective because remember the plantation was a total system. We had no, we, we didn't have communication of any substantial nature outside of the plantation. And people were actually prevented from using the ceremonies and what not to pass on the traditions with which we keep. It was a struggle in itself to keep any of those traditions alive. And some of them were kept alive because they were just seen as people didn't recognize the importance of them. But knowledge is what they destroyed. Knowledge in our heads is what they destroyed, coming down intergenerationally. And that is why the education system now has to, to see itself as corrected. It's important now because I always say the worst four-letter word is not the one people think about when you say a four-letter word. It is STEM. That thing that says education is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And I feel everybody should learn those subjects. I'm not against STEM. But when STEM becomes the content of education, what you are doing is leaving those who feel, those, are, those of us, that especially Africans, who have been totally miseducated. It means those components of education that build the sense of self pride in who you are, what you're all about, what have you contributed to 
mankind historically and all of that, those who have been denied that knowledge are the ones who will be destroyed when education is reduced to those categories. And again, I want to emphasize, because oh, boy, science is not important. No, I think science is very important. Very, very important. But you could learn all the science you want, and if you don't have a sense of who you are, we as a group would continue to be manipulated by other people. They wouldn't only have to use guns, because now they, they, they keep us in check with or without the guns. And we have to understand that. The, the the, the issue, of course, and, and we want to thank you for, for that, um, Brother Cambon, and, and I suppose there are some issues will now come out of that, because um, one of my recollections, and, and you, you, cited, you cited the history for us, and one of my recollections um, at the time was someone of prominence getting up and saying in the middle of all that you just described, that bit of history, saying, quote unquote, Indians are not black, right? And, and that statement survived. And, and, and it, it boggles my mind that that has survived. And there are a number of other things that we, we um, those of us who are African, are now saying on the 20th of November tonight that there are things that have been suppressed. Um, that's the word that we've used. Um, we need a certain degree of force. That's, that's the kind of language we, we are using tonight. And we are recognizing and apparently agreeing that the formal education system is um, twisted, if I use that verb, I can't think of a better one, away from things that might be African. And, and, and Dr. Hodge raised um, one of the important things, and, and it, it came up during my tenure in the formal education system, where you got an instruction from the Ministry of Education, don't teach history anymore, um, don't teach geography anymore, and, um, and what could you do about it? Um, probably nothing. And you started teaching social studies. So the little bit of history that we had before, that was wiped off. The geography, and look at the kind of, look at the islands we live in. And they have stopped teaching geography. And you get this, uh, I, I believe, um, Dr. Hodge used the word, this nebulous subject called social studies. So you have neither the geography to sustain you, that geographical knowledge that you need if you live on an island. And Brother Cambon just raised the issue of self. And if the history is destroyed, then you do not have a knowledge of self. And what is baffling me is that we seem to be saying that we need to approach the same authorities who control education to ask them to put in some culture and to, you know, to put in some African and, but, but they removed it in the first instance. So I want to, to, to posit that maybe we are looking at the wrong, um, we're looking at the wrong solution. Um, those who control formal education will not do what perhaps we ought to be doing for ourselves. Um, Alan Herwood, you've been silent for a long time. Yeah, I had listened to the two questions you had asked, um, one being about Indians, um, if Indians are black. Well, nobody's black really, eh? We are dark skinned. And as far as the world outside here is concerned, it's enough to bite the black. So all this cutting corners and dividing up and taking sides on this story, I would say that we are all black in that sense of the world. We are not black in the sense of the color black. 
because we had dark skin and we are all black. There was, um, the thing about the edit, no, there was another question that was asked about Christianity. Yeah, whether Christianity has been a positive or a negative influence as far as African consciousness is concerned. I mean, I have, um, I have synthesized the question, but that's what I think is, is being asked. I, I, I would say, yes, it is very negative. Um, once slave owners recognized that they could get a slave to sing, yes, he does love me. It was free to, he could have freed the slaves. He didn't need to keep them as slaves anymore. Um, you know, had, had African people believe in something that was so foreign to our culture and thinking that that was our savior, you know, forget what is being done for you today. As far as Christianity was concerned, slavery was a good thing. The law was concerned that slavery was legal. So these things stood against us. And if we could accept the Christianity and the legal system, well, then they don't need to have us seen anymore. We're going to throw the line, the police ourselves. They don't need to send their people to police us. We police ourselves and deal with us look at ourselves maybe even more brutal than non-Africans would deal with us. So those things taken into context, I would say yes, that slavery, um, slavery was perpetuated up to today with a Christian belief. That um and I'm not saying that Africa has anything better to offer, maybe it does. I'm not too versed in, into it. But I consider religion as a whole as just something to maintain uh, a status quo and go rock the boat, you know, this kind of thing. Um, get on your knees and pray, get on whatever. And things will work out when you're dead, you know, this kind of thing. And that doesn't make sense to me. It makes no sense at all. Um, as regards where we go with education, that is the value you haven't been an educator would you know. Um, there needs to be a, and maybe social media could play a role in raising an awareness that we of what we really need in education and try to get the government to have a look at it. Um, look at what the education system is doing to our youth. It's not, it's, not, it's not carrying them forward anywhere yet. A lot of children just go through the system and they come out as some people claim they can't even read. And that is because the teachers, they are not committed. In our days, we had teachers that were committed. I went to school for years and never knew a teacher take a day off. You know, kind of thing. And now that is a regular occurrence every week. Teachers not turning up. Some of them do turn up for months. Um, we need more commitment in our education system. As I was saying, too much of one ethnic group controls the teaching service. So African children are being left on the wayside by the South Um the, the question, of course, I would have asked, and it's very interesting, and, and you know, I have a personal interest because I've spent a lot of my life, like Dr. Hodge, in, in the education system where you saying you went to school as a child and for years a teacher did not take a day off and now it has become commonplace. Um, but I don't think, well, or maybe I shouldn't say what you, you are thinking. Are there African, African teachers who are doing this injustice, if it is injustice, to mm -hmm. African children? Yes, I would have to say it's across the board. It's a, um, I don't see that race really. Race comes into it, yes, but um, for that specific thing about just not turning up to school, a lot of African teachers do it. Some teachers are known that they don't come to work on a Friday or they don't come to work on a Monday. And they sell them come on a particular day. Like that is their day off to go and do their stuff. And the children are left either with a substitute teacher or sent another class to 
um, get some supervision. But um, I don't think um, race comes into play that much in that scenario. I think it's both Indian and Africans who partake in that stuff. That, 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 that brings me to another issue I want to raise, Mr. Herewood, if we could start with you. And it has to do with, with leadership, right? Um, so I want to ask the question, um, and you know, either, well, I'll start with you, but Merle or Kafra could respond. Um, where is the African leadership in Trinidad and Tobago and um, in the wider Caribbean? Um, so if it is, and, and, and I am not sure that we have dealt with one of the burning issues I started with because we seem to be saying um, the media is important and the media is responsible for some of what has happened to our consciousness. The education system has been responsible for some of what has happened to our consciousness. As, as black people, this is the Black Consciousness Festival. And um, we've, we've tried to split the hairs a little bit and make a difference between African and black and so on. But we seem to be still waiting on someone else who might not necessarily have our best interests at heart to do for us what we should be doing for ourselves. So who is the trade union leader who is consciously black, who will say to all black teachers in Trinidad and Tobago, for example, um, African children are being left behind and therefore we African teachers must take a stand. We're going to work harder than everybody else. And I want to start with the Calypso that the conversation started with um, Stalin said we've got to work 10 times harder harder so there, there has to be well I am I am this is my solution a leader who will emerge who would say to African people there's a way you need to behave uh, uh, so the point that Alan Herewood is making about stay home Friday and stay home Monday African teachers will not do that anymore because we have a particular obligation to African children to ensure that they will be educated because we can't depend on the Ministry of Education. I, I, I don't know whether any of my colleagues want to respond to the statement that I am now making. Um, I think um, you asked where is the leader going to come from? No, I am, I, well, yeah, but it's, it's a rhetorical question. I am saying that maybe what we need is that kind of inspirational leadership because yeah. the formal systems, the formal media system, the formal education system has not been doing it for us. And are we failing when we seem to be saying well, um, they will have to do so and so. The, the, um, you see, the, the, the society is so geared and focused on money that a leader come in with ideas, good ideas, but no financial substance is going to find themselves very easily silenced by people with money. And we have to look past this physical well-being then to get proper ideas out there. Yeah, I mean, you see somebody might come with um, very good ideas and they recognize, boy, you know, I'm going to lose my job. And I'm not going to be able to get another group because people are going to have me down as this troublemaker or whatever the truth is, the press decides to label you as. Um, so people are less likely going to come and put themselves out in the front line to be so abused. 
God. We have to get leaders who think more of the greater good than themselves. But that, this is precisely my question, Mr. Harewood. Um, where are we finding these leaders? Well, we have to find one in, some in Trinidad here. We have to find some. Just say that, Dr. Hart. Sorry, oh, sorry, I had you. No, no, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah that, that, it's a kind of, hmm. Um, okay, this, this is a sensitive thing that, that when you, when you're a teacher, to, to, to see yourself as a, as a black teacher specifically and to having to, to put out more, having to have a different relationship with the, with the, the, the children who, who are, you know, who, who, are, who are also African. And I want to just, I, I want to just say that the, that some years ago, the teacher who, who took hold of a, a little boy who that level, I don't know how little the boy was, but I mean I think it's in high school level, and he had a, I, I don't know what you call it because I'm most ignorant. It's a, a, the, the child was Orisha, and he had had a, some ceremony performed, and it involved wearing, a, I don't know what you would call that, something around his wrist, and the lady sort of grabbed it, ripped it off of him, and said. All your people need the blood of Christ on all year. <laughs> right? So I don't know that that I'm saying that African teachers are to take on this this role of of, of um, taking that specific specific care of African children. And I don't think that all that all the teachers are equipped for it in the first place, but I also think it's 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 kind of risky to think in, in those terms. When when you're a teacher, you're a teacher of, of all the children. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't see see myself having a a specific responsibility for the, the children who are this, this of the same ethnicity as me. No, uh, no, no. I, I I don't want you to to you know misunderstand the question, and maybe I need to clarify it before you go further. Um, and I was taken off from the point made by by Mr. Herewood that he knew a time, and and I did, I did too. When, when, the, when um, a teacher taking a day off was something unheard of, right? Now you are hearing the opposite of that. And in fact, within the formal education system, on particular days, you can hear officials from the ministry sending to us principals to send a report as to how many teachers were absent on X day or Y day or Z day. There was not the need for that, yeah. and no, and and I am talking about a, a, an awareness or a consciousness, whereas the teacher, it's not so much that you are looking out and making a distinction between who is in your class. It's not that; it is that you know, any time you are absent, the children lose out, but because of the other circumstances, the social, the economic, the political, and so on, that maybe the African children would lose more than the others simply because they are African children and they come with a particular set of baggage, right? So whenever you stay away, there might be all, all other ethnicities in the class, but the African child will suffer most and therefore you don't stay away because maybe that's where your grounding is. And, and, and I was only throwing that out as a position. Yeah, Could but I, you know, I, I just want to say one, one, one yeah. small thing I want to say, because I saw this development happen. I saw it before my eyes. When I came back home from studying in 1970, I went in, into teaching. I first taught in a, uh, an ordinary secondary school where, where you were much more of a community with, with, with teachers almost taking a parental role towards children than when some of the teachers in that same school that I was teaching in were taken out because they were building a Rima Senior Comprehensive and we went there. And I saw that, I saw the stress that that put on teachers. And one of the ways of dealing with the stress is to just stay away from it every now and then. These big warehouses that they built, warehouses, you can't, you, you don't know any child name because there's how much thousand of them. We had a rule once, we made a rule, if it, we, one step will be for coming down and one step will be for going up. You think any, any, anybody take us on? Because you can't say, Johnny over there, you're going the wrong way on this step. You don't know a child name. You know, that I think was one, one big 
I don't want to call it a mistake because it made secondary education more available to everybody, but putting children in those big warehouses with a thousand thousands of children was one thing that did a great deal of damage to the quality of 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 of, an, of, um, of education, you know. So teachers are under a lot of stress, and that is something that has to be addressed. People have to get together and talk about it and make recommendations and 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 all of that. That really didn't happen in the past. The teachers took on my uh, my sisters went to St. George's, my son went there as well. They knew the teachers knew every child's name. The teachers would take an interest in individual children. The teachers would don't don't they making sure they flush the toilet and all of that kind of thing. They took on the rule almost as a parental thing. Then boom you're gone in these big fat schools where it's it's just you know anonymity. You know, so I mean that that, that is what I, I have to say about that. That thing about teacher absenteeism and, and, and lack of commitment and all of that. Right. Mr. Cambon, you wanted to say something. Yes, I, I want to say that we have to recognize that we need to have to change the education system, including and with very particular emphasis on the education curriculum. Because once school happens and children are absorbing something in the school, it should be something positive that just doesn't teach them to add and subtract, but to give people a sense of who they are. Who you are in terms of your heritage, and that goes back to where you originally came from since you were brought into this space. And also in terms of what did we create while we are here. And if the curriculum doesn't give us a sense of that and a sense of wholeness, as a people with a long past and a people who have continued to be creative and to be inventive in our new environment, and not just people who were like nobody making no contribution to civilization, scrambled from the coast of Africa, brought here and just and just labor. We didn't bring any knowledge with us, any, you know, any sense of anything with us. Now, if people have that view of themselves you have a problem. So you have to change the education curriculum. That's a part of the system that has to change. And if you are changing that, you also have to do reframing of the teachers. And it has to do with just not, just not new information, but also the question of cultural sensitivity. Because you could have teachers, and even though a teacher would look like me or any of us here on this, on, on this program, they don't necessarily have a cultural sensitivity to children who look like us. You have, you have factors of class, you have factors of the images of certain children portrayed on the media all of the time. You have the real problems of children who come from difficult and challenging environments and the way in which you know you need to establish how do you do that in this so that it so that even to impart the adding and the subtraction and the reading, you need a training to be challenging the environment and all of that. So there has to be a retraining of the teachers based on a diagnosis of what the problems are, both at the level of what the pedagogy as well as content of the, of, of the you know the material that's in the system and all of that and how do you impart it and how do you embrace uh, and, so on. and and we have had some experience in schools I have had some social um, experience because we have had some programs some years ago we had a program that we ran in, in, in have until and then one day here and so and um, the classes that people considered difficult. And we had no special training. Well we did we did include some teachers as well. Some of them I had no formal training in teaching. But it, I had a sensitivity. I had a concern, a, a deep concern for children who looked like me and who were falling out of the system. 
And therefore, that was enough to give me some ability to be able to communicate. And that was so many of what we had involved in that program. But you see, these things are difficult to succeed because people have their jobs, they have their other activities, and therefore you get to do for a while and then you begin to get tired until you have to sort of go back on it. And we talk about something that has to be done at a wide level. And that is why we must look at the formal system. Otherwise, we make little interventions here and there to help a few people, but we are not changing the dynamic of what is happening and the reason down our career. And then we have the people down all about things that we do. So you got to get a lawyer and go into the ministry. Because a young man who was one of the more disciplined people who never had any discipline history on his record and he's going in the sport and he's going sport sport. Goes to school on a regular basis. When you meet his mother, you know why. I think you know one of the reasons why. Right? Because even though she doesn't have much formal education, she knows the importance of it and she instilled that in her children. And what does that child? Face expulsion for because he's starting to very extremely. You put the papers out in the you put the papers out in the what I was saying is the papers he saw and we had to go and negotiate about that. And before we even went to the ministry, we got a signal from the to send them on the child side we have, and I think that would have helped to turn things. Wrong, but that happens for that child. But that is happening in schools all over. The children are not, instead of the, children, the, the teachers understanding the culture from which the children came. And sometimes you can't blame the teachers for not understanding because of their own backgrounds and everything else. So we have to build these things into a system. Otherwise, we put in lots of energy into a small thing here and a small thing there. But the trend. Of, of, of Africans falling out of the society will get worse and worse. That, that's what I would say on that education aspect of it. Yeah, and you, you are quite right, but that those problems are not being addressed. They're not being recognized by, by the, the, the authorities. You know, a lot a lot of healing has to happen, but just going down the road and children to exam. All, yeah. all of those hu human things n need to be looked in the eye, and, and, and then we, we, we see how to how to deal with them? What kind and of retraining are, teachers need? You know, I, I went to I went to deal with a class at a school in London. I didn't do the teacher because it was part of a program that we used to have on Saturday morning. Sorry, um, come on. Every, every few minutes, every few words, we lose. Well, I'm you losing a word. I don't know. Everybody's hearing every one of your words clearly, but I'm Maybe fidgeting with this thing. And it's it's like uh, Mr. Yeah. Moderator? Yeah. Um, Mr. Kambon, we, we're getting an issue with, with your audio. Yeah. It, your audio has, has become a little fuzzy. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if there's any adjustments you can make. Um, not that I know. Were, were you hearing me before? Anything uh, that... ye yes, we were hearing you before. Before, clearly. Up to about five minutes ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the, then the audio started to get a little fuzzy. That may so, be... That might be the internet itself, so I doubt I could do. Any... I mean, it, it, it's fine now, but but notice now you are sitting forward. So yes, I've, I've, right. I've, I've, so so maybe you need to continue sitting forward. Yes, I, I will continue to sit forward. Right. You know, sometimes teachers who are good could communicate the wrong messages. That's why, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I, I'll give you uh, a school that we used to teach in, and this is up on the. The hill in Lab until there, up on the hill. Uh, do Saturday classes with them. And the class that I used to deal with, one of the mornings I went up, the classroom that I normally used was not available. And we, we had to go to another classroom. When I went into that classroom, it was the kind of classroom you could tell that the teacher is one who has some concern for the children. Mm -hmm. And there were Lots of drawings, and I suspect a number of them done by the teacher. Drawings and paintings that were around the um, classroom. 
as teaching aids to the children. Mm -hmm. And one of them had a picture of a white blonde child with long blonde fats and holding a book in her hand. And what was written on the cover of the book that you were seeing when you looked at the said, you didn't make me beautiful. So Sorry, here, I didn't get that. So what you, was written you, on? Yeah, yeah. You, need to, you need to repeat what was written on the book. We missed yeah. that. On the book was written, reading makes me beautiful. <laughs> and it was a white, blonde <laughs> guy <laughs> with long, blonde, uh, yeah, and yeah. blue eyes too. <laughs> now, mm. No, you just look around that classroom and you hear, here's a teacher who wants to teach, mm -hmm. who is looking for creative ways to communicate with her students. But the message that she is communicating, and I'm willing to bet she's not even conscious of it, is a message that is damaging to the children that she mm -hmm. And you know, having experiences like that is what makes me so convinced that we have to do a whole lot of training with our teachers and cultural sensitivity, historical understanding, things of that kind mm -hmm. have to be an important part of that training. And not only from those wrong messages point of view, but also from learning how to deal with children who are coming from different backgrounds. Because class differences have become even sharper in Trinidad and to be able to do. And the things that are verbalized and put in the media about people in our most ostracized and impoverished communities are becoming more and more extreme. Freedom. So, you know, you know, so we have to look at the society we are, we are living in. We have to look at the things that are developing in the society and see how we are going to correct them mm -hmm. in the education system. And it's not going to happen if there is not a lot of attention to curriculum and its content and the retraining of teachers. It can't just be the techniques of to show them, you know, how to show them a book, how to teach them, how to pronounce words and all that has to be done. Yeah. Um, well, media like, action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, um, I, and I wanted to say, and, and I'm saying to the panel, um, I, I believe we've reached the stage where we're looking at, um, you know, final words, winding up, um, trying to see whether we could contextualize this conversation we've been having for, well, a bit more than two hours now, um, and getting this information to the centers where the information needs to go. We've identified um, a couple of critical things here this evening. Um, education jumps out at us. Um, something needs to be done, um, and the issue is, how and where and by whom. Um, there is, of course, the media. Um, some suggestion has been made that maybe there could be a kind of counterintelligence via social media. And of course, behind all of that is the fact that there is so much of disunity. Um, the theme this evening is revolution and writing. And looking exactly at that, clearly um, there needs to be some changes, some revolutions, and um, we need to correct things. Things need to be put right. Um, and Mel, I want to start with you as we go the other way. Um, how, how do we, I mean, from the conversation we've had this evening, if there was something that we were to take away and to put somewhere, what would you take away and where would you put it? How do we right the wrongs or 
what is the next stage, if I put the question another way. So, Dr. Hodge, um, let's start. We'll start our final words with you. Yeah, well, we, we have covered so much ground that it's a bit difficult to, to figure out which of those things. But since, since I've been in education all that time and I've experienced this, this school system here, per, perhaps that is something that should be looked at every, every now and then. It is, you know, you don't assume that, that everything is going all right and so, so forth. Um, I remember while I was teaching secondary school, Eric Williams had a whole conference on, on secondary education. I mean, I don't know if, if it produced the, the results that, that we, we need here. Maybe you need some smaller, some, some closer examination in, in, in smaller groups as, as to what, 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 what is going wrong and, and what is going right too, of course, but how we can better, better equip our, our schools to, 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 to tackle the needs that we are, we, we are recognizing, the needs that, that are being, being identified. Um, and I, I don't know, I, did, um, I mean, the Ministry of Education is one of the largest ministries in the country, you know, like in terms of um, personnel. And sometimes it's a little difficult to negotiate inside of there because it is such a, 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 um, a complex place. But you see, what, one, one of the places where that kind of problem solving and solution building could happen if the if 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 there was more interest in the PTA, th there should be a lot more of, um, activity go going on at PTA level. People identifying problems, coming up with suggestions as to how to solve them. But how do you get that? Come once it gets it comes back to that same community thing, you know, in a sense of collective responsibility. In sense of collective responsibility, it can't just be a big thing with the whole country. The the individual school is a is a collective. So you you the people who are relevant there. The parents and the and the, the, the teachers need to, um, you know, t t talk and and identify the the problems and ask for whatever help is needed. You have you have student support services. I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know whether there are parent support services as well, but the problems are, are to be confronted, analyzed, and on the basis of of analyses, solutions found. You know. Yes. Thank you. So, thank you so much, Dr. Hodge. Al mm -hmm. Alan Herewood, um, if you had to put a wrap, um, some final words, advice, suggestion, solution, takeaways. Um, as you had mentioned about where we're going to find a leader. Right. Yeah. Um, perpetuate this type of discussion and the type of education we want to see our young people getting. Um, it is a very daunting aspect of the whole thing. I mean, they say in 1970, people will look at Dada and um, Kafra. Yeah, and we would um, identify them as leaders who were making an effort to do what needed to be done then at the time. Um, Today, I don't know. The leaders are there. Some people call them community leaders. I remember one particular fella on an afternoon, he would like literally sit down with uh, with money and the school children would come and who need money for lunch tomorrow and who need um, pass it to the school. And he would just go and out money to the school children. And they all came from school, they needed money for tomorrow. Um, well, uh, the, 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 the life goes out there, he's now dead. Um, I think some level of that is needed. Um, and maybe from there we could find a leader with a good head on the carriers forward. Um, I don't mean, when I said, yeah, I, I don't mean a young leader per se, you know, uh, uh, at all for that matter but somebody in the community who is respected and can assist school children is a big asset. I think um, we need that type of stuff multiplied by a few hundred in Trinidad. Um, Brother Cambon, it seems as though the final words have come to you. 
Um, we, 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 we've been chatting and um, if you had to point a direction um, where at this stage, 20th of November, 2020, where do you point the African in terms of his consciousness or in terms of revolutionizing what has happened or, or writing the things that have been wrong with African as a people, particularly in Trinidad and the Caribbean? I, I would say that apart from lobbying for what we need to get from uh, strong interest groups like the, like the state itself, and like the need and like the formal uh, conventional media that we need. And this is where young people are very important who don't have challenges in getting into a, a Zoom meeting and so people who are not at my level. Uh, we need young people who would internalize the messages and know the way in which to transmit them because they are now the experts on social media. And they are the ones now who can use the social media. We're no longer in an era where you could have the mass meetings and the impact of the, of the mass meetings like what we had in 1970. And outside of that mode of communication, social media is the most powerful instrument now and we have to get those who are adept at it, work with them, maybe get a group of them, all of us in different spheres where we have the capacity and sort of share with them the kind of messages to transmit and, and let us get it out through several, from several different sources in social media. I think social media is now gonna be very um, critical. In, in, in what we do, you see, but all our methods are more old fashioned because, you know, we have like a history caravan, for example, which we have been offering to the school for years. Sometimes we have had problems because the school don't have the kind of transport to bring it down, you know, or a pickup and that kind of thing. We don't always have the money to do it. And, um, you know, we just formed a partner, formed a partner <laughs> uh, this year who offered and said, look, when you have to move those things, we would help you so they could get to school the kind of pay for the transport. But now all of that is out of the door, given the new reality. So I don't think we have any choice now but to use the social media. And um, when we are having programs like this, get some people involved who know how to pull in another generation and those of us who well, those seem to have been. Well, I, well, I think she might have some of us. Uh, we need to pull in people without grief. As well, he would help us to, uh, you know, get this, get, get the messages out through the social media. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Merle Hodge, Mr. Allen Herewood, um, Mr. Kafra Kambon, I, I want to thank you very much for agreeing to be in my company for the last couple of hours. It, um, it has been very, very enlightening. It has been very edifying. Um, I want to repeat uh, my expression of gratitude to the organizers for thinking about me and for putting me with such a distinguished panel of, uh, of colleagues so that we could participate in the Black Consciousness Festival and um, I would like, on behalf of the panel, to wish the organizers well. I understand that there are five more conversations to come. Um, it has been, I believe, a tremendous effort, I understand, by a very small group of persons. But um, I want to think that the results are far more wide ranging that even the organizers might want to imagine. I have requested, um, if you'd be patient with me, one more Calypso to close the conversation. And then at the end of that Calypso, it's one by Lord Kitchener. Um, 
the conversation goes back to the organizers, um, to the listeners, to the participants, to those who pose questions, those who have listened to us. Thank you so very, very much. And um, I would like to say it has been exhilarating and I do feel refreshed. And I think um, an appropriate Calypso is the mm -hmm. best way to end the conversation. So I'm asking the technical operator, please, if you're not white, you're black. Mm -hmm. Lord Kitchener. Your father is an African Your mother may be Norwegian You pass me, you wouldn't say goodnight Feeling you are really white Your skin may be a little pink and that's the reason why you think that the complexion of your face can hide you from the Negro race. No, you can never get away from the fact if you're not white, you considered black. You jut along the thoroughfare you shake your waist like Fred Astia And when you see me passing by You watch me with a crooked eye And yet you speak to Mr. B Who does not want your company In every way you endeavor To show yourself superior No, you can never get away from the fact if you not white, you considered black. Your Negro hair is obvious. You make it more conspicuous. You use all sorts of Vaseline to make out you a European. You speak with exaggeration make the greatest impression that you were taught apparently at Cambridge University. No, you can never get away from the fact if you're not white, you considered black. You hate the name of Africa the land of your great-grandfather the country where you can't be wrong the home where you really belong you rather be amongst the fights than stick up for your father's rights and very often from your face to think you are from the Negro race no you can never get away from the fact if you not white, you considered black. Thank you very much to Short Pants, to Professor Hodge, to Alan Harewood, and to Kafra Cambon for having carried on tonight's um, keynote conversation of all the conversations that we have planned for the month of November, celebrating Black consciousness. We thank you all, our viewers who have tuned in either via Zoom or via Facebook, and we ask you to continue to join us throughout the rest of the month as we continue to speak about Black consciousness in the diaspora. Coming up to close off our week, tomorrow at 1 p.m., we have Dr. Charleston Thomas and Justin Peterkin discussing Tobago and jazz history. At 7 p.m. tomorrow, we have music, DJs in the dance, where we have Haitian and Brazilian DJs who will be introducing us to compa and other types of music. And importantly as well, we have teamed up with Africa Film Trinidad and Tobago, and we will be streaming a film from midday tomorrow until midday on Sunday using africafilmtt.com. The film will be Hassa race, a Brazilian film about inequality in Brazil. 
So feel free to join us for these activities and to continue to join us for all other activities during the month of November. Our calendar of events is posted on our website, theblackconsciousnessfestival.com. Also, you can view our Facebook channel as well as our YouTube channel for recaps of all the events that have taken place so far for the month. We thank you very much for having participated with us, for having joined us, and we invite you to continue so to do until November 30th. Do have a good night. Good night. Good night.